Darko Burkhan was born in Sarajevo in 1979. He is a graduate of the Electro-Technical Faculty in Sarajevo, majoring in Information Technology. Burkhan has been active in the non-governmental sector for 10 years. He started as one of the leaders of the Campaign for Conscientious Objection that resulted in the recognition of the right to conscientious objection and finally the abolishment of conscription. Later, he was the president of the organization Why Not, dealing with civic activism, political advocacy, and pu public transparency. He's also a board member of Akipa, a foundation promoting independent culture and one of the leaders of the informal movement, DOSTA. Burkhan also has experience as a trainer in many fields, nonviolence, NGO cooperation, campaigning, advocacy, new media, and new technologies, and is a member of the alumni of the Academy of Political Excellence of the Council of Europe and in the U.S. after completing the International Visitors Leadership Program. Vanessa Ortiz is Senior Director for Civic and Field Learning at ICNC. She is also the founder of In Women's Hands, an initiative that supports the study, documentation, and practice of the powerful role of women in strategic nonviolent action. And you can learn more about that initiative by visiting inwomenshands.org. Before joining ICNC, she worked for several international humanitarian organizations, both overseas and in the United States. As project officer in the resettlement department of the International Rescue Committee, she led a three-year capacity building program that helped strengthen refugee community-based organizations in the U.S. from 2003 to 2004. Uh, she served as special assistant to the president of Center for Humanitarian Cooperation, a not-for-profit organization created to assist the international humanitarian community in developing models for greater cooperation. Her global experience includes work with Mercy Corps in their overseas office in Kandahar, Afghanistan in 2002, and the Office of the High Representative in Sarajevo, Bosnia's first post-war civilian peace implementation organization from 1996 to 1998. Ms. Ortiz's education includes a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from the New York Univer Institute of Technology and a Master of Arts degree from the Fletcher School at Tufts University through his Global Masters of Arts program. In 2006, she completed the Fletcher Summer Institute for the Advanced Study of Nonviolent Conflict. She has also participated in professional development trainings at the Harvard Law School Program on Negotiation, in the International NGO Training and Research Center in Oxford, and with the American University of Cairo Refugee Studies Program. With that, I hand it over to our presenters. Thank you, Darren. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. Okay, great. And Darko um, is out there too, and um, we're very fortunate to have him uh, joining us from Sarajevo today. Um, Darko, you're there, right? Yeah, I'm here. Thank you for inviting me. It's great to be here. Okay, great. So um, I'm just going to. Um, hmm. Okay, here we go. Okay, so um, the reason I think that uh, in a case like Bosnia, and I'm not sure, I, I'm assuming that many of you who have, um, who are participating in, in our webinar today uh, either have some knowledge or some interest in uh, Bosnia and the Balkans in general, but I think that one of the reasons why it's important to look at civil resistance in the context of a post-conflict uh, country and region as well as an emerging democracy and, and a country uh, like many in, in the Balkans right now that are entering um, different negotiations and phases uh, for European integration, um, it's important to look at the role of civil resistance um, in these settings. Uh, I think that here I've outlined a couple of points of why civil resistance is important and essential in uh, going from conflict to uh, democracy and, and for building stability. Um, civil resistance, as many of you may, may know and, and, and agree to, it's an opportunity to build uh, citizen capacity uh, from, from the grassroots level uh, without top-down um, um, you know, dictates, let's say. Uh, it's an opportunity for people to get involved in different local issues 
and to become aware of other issues through um, activism uh, and organizing. Um, it's also, let's say, a people-centered way to defend um, the values of human rights, democracy, civil liberties, uh, and civic participation from below. And, and this is especially important as we look at the EU integration process and um, all of these things, in fact, the development of civil society and civil participation is, is completely in line with, um, with European values. Um, civil resistance is also a way of providing leadership opportunities and um, civic roles for women. And in traditionally, where in countries where women don't have um, political opportunity or, or a tradition of political participation or, or the space uh, to be an active um, member in, in politics, um, organizing and participating in some level of civic action um, allows women to um, express their grievances, push for women's rights, um, and and um, promote uh, the awareness or, or change for local issues and community-centered issues. Um, and finally, especially in the case of Bosnia, um, it, it, civil resistance offers an alternative uh, for peaceful dissent um, rather than violent um, you know, ways of, of, uh, of trying to, to um, I don't know, promote nationalism and these kind of things. This civil resistance is a way to, to not use violent means in order to, um, um, opposition groups can express each other um, in, in more productive ways and people-centered ways. So today, we're going to cover two, uh, two cases. One case is uh, the women of Srebrenica, um, their citizens' associations. And the other case is Dosta, where Darko will come in and um, actively participate and orient us to um, you know, their founding and also what they've done. But first, uh, I wanted to talk about a little bit about the women in Srebrenica, because this is a very unique uh, struggle there that's been going on now 14 years um, with a lot of success as well as a lot of ongoing um, challenges and, and uh, a combination of great organizing with chaotic and confusing organizing. But I, I think that to these women's uh, credit, they really have made this uh, worldwide, global, and international issue. This, this issue of uh, the atrocities that happened in the western part of Bosnia, specifically in Srebrenica, and um, um, the, the case of missing family members, uh, men, through a genocidal campaign there. Um, I think that we can see correlations of their movement to other women's movements around missing persons, like the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo in Argentina, as well as the mothers of the disappeared in Chile. Um, so there, you know, for me personally, this is a very interesting study of um, activism and um, disruptive methods uh, in order to push uh, an agenda of truth and, and in some ways leading to reconciliation uh, in their country and justice. So, um, I am referencing, uh, and for your, you know, this will be available online, but if you want to learn more about this movement, uh, I used, personally, these are my favorite articles, uh, one of them by Olivera Simic, um, who really, really outlines uh, in, in great detail some of the complexities of, of the women's movement there, as well as some of their um, successes. And uh, then there is another kind of angle taken by uh, uh, another woman, I believe. Um, I believe she's Norwegian. Or, I'll have to look into that. Uh, and it's called Stories from No, Man, uh, from no Land. Um, and then I, I also you know, want to uh, um, offer you to reference yourself some of the work that I did this summer in interviewing the women and publishing 
you know, on a daily blog, um, some of the conversations and the analysis that I came up with. So um, that's just for your reference, and Darren will make that available uh, on the ICMC website uh, later. So from uh, Selma's, I, I really, really uh, like this quote, and this was one, when I read this article, this was one of the things that really sort of uh, kind of got my blood boiling because I was like, this is so typical. Uh, you know, she says in, in her paper that the women have been portrayed as mad mothers of Srebrenica um, who've had a history of clashes with police. One woman told her about a protest in 1996 in Tuzla where they were told they were wild animals um, while all they had done was ask for information. And I think this is really the case. Uh, we can look historically back and romanticize some of these women's movements, uh, particularly in Argentina and Chile, but the reality for the women that are in a, a struggle is that very often in society they're and in the end from the outside, not so much from within the society, they're looked at crazy ladies or crazy old ladies who won't, you know, play according to, you know, international rules. Uh, they're making noise. They're uh, blocking traffic. And um, I, this really sparked me to really dig further um, and, and talk with them and, and um, you know, explore more. Uh, one of the things uh, also that um, Olivera Simich brings out in her report is this element of seeking the truth and telling the truth as a form of resistance. Um, and she says here, which I think is just a brilliant summary of their work, you know, despite the challenges that they faced, these women joined together, they left their private sphere of mourning into the public domain demanding a series of actions to be taken both by the local and international governments. And in doing so, they transform their experience as victims into activism. And I really think that this is like an essence of civil resistance. It turns the, the, the individual and the community and the society from victims to people with power and a realization of your power. And one of the things that, that the women of Srebrenica did was really bring international attention and respect to their demands. Um, their, you know, some of their work is, is uh, lobbying, some of it is, is concrete protests, persuasion, non-cooperation. Um, but what they're doing is really complex because in a way it's simultaneous reconciliation work with um, retributive justice work. So bringing those to justice while at the same time um, reconciling with the, you know, with the, the Serb forces that they're living with as neighbors. Um, so I, I just find the movement itself amazing and, and um, very um, inspiring. Um, now shifting to strategic thinking. Um, this is how they outlined their primary demands, and this is coming all the way back from 1996. Um, they sort of outlined their, their goals, and um, here there are six of them, um, very clear. Um, they want to uncover the full facts of what happened during that massacre and reveal it and publicize it. They want uh, assistance and, and um, participation in the exhumation of all the graves and all bodies identified. They want uh, a release of imprisoned survivors that are in neighboring, uh, both in Serbia, Montenegro, and also in Republic of Serbska within Bosnia. Uh, a right of uh, return for refugees that lived in Srebrenica. Um, full and open international investigation of what happened during that uh, UN failure in the safe areas, and uh, arrest and justice trial for um, all suspected war criminals. Um, now, within that large framework of goals, some of the ways that they've tackled it um, and, and accomplished the, the, those goals are through these different nonviolent methods that I outline here, and I'm basically categorizing them according to acts of omission and acts of commission. 
and I'm not sure how many of you attended Hardy's really great webinar a few weeks ago where he talked more about this, but basically what he outlined is that, you know, um, these acts of omission and commission are basically nonviolent acts that um, use different, uh, they have strategies behind them either of defiance, of civil disobedience, of pressure, of disruption, and, and I kind of say in acts of omission, uh, it's a withdrawal of support and a form of non-cooperation. So they do this through, um, you know, persona non grata activities and threats, which may seem really severe, and especially for the international community there, this is, you know, sometimes why they feel the women of Serbanita are making too much noise. But basically what they do is name and shame uh, different uh, actors, not only the war criminals themselves, but also people that they consider were complicit um, during the events there. They openly challenge structures and, and uh, systems, the UN system, the international community during that time, the Dutch government and their participation, and in fact, um, even using lawsuits uh, against uh, the UN um, for not preventing um, the massacre. Um, in the acts of commission, what I'm calling pressure and disruption and uh, or intervention, um, it's protest activities, peace marches. Uh, they run a bulletin. Um, again, it's a form of naming and shaming, but it's kind of also, you know, a way of galvanizing support uh, and, and gaining legitimacy in their communities. They publish meeting notes to the general public. So what they do is they they um, they gather the notes that and and put them in a way that regular people can understand what is the terminology being used around you know, international community decisions and these kind of things. Um, they expose refugee issues and the problems that returnees face. So in, in many cases, they have a lot of interaction with different uh, international organizations there. Um, and they verify and witness mass grave exhumations. So um, they really serve, in a way, as a watchdog for some of these activities. And again, you know, I mean, now that I look at this, I say, well, some of these um, actions or these methods can sort of fall into the other. And I basically tried, but I think the fact is that sometimes acts of omission and commission are so intermingled uh, and, and, and are both that it becomes a little bit difficult to, to uh, categorize them. But you know, I tried. Um, and just to, to conclude on, on these women, um, some of their successes in the past 14 years are really just mass commemoration. Um, there's a ceremony every year, and they really pushed hard uh, not to forget. Uh, there was uh, last year a resolution uh, adopted by the European Parliament, and this in large part was because of their proposal to do this, uh, marking July 11th as the annual day of mourning. And this is not only in, in Bosnia, but in uh, many other countries, too, um, mark this day. Um, they have really uh, been instrumental in uh, establishing or helping establish accountability systems uh, in the exhumation and identification process. Uh, they have continued to put pressure on the Dutch government. And um, in fact, there was a case many years ago where the Dutch parliament really, they all resigned because a lot of the noise and the attention that the women were bringing to the neglect um, and complicity during the events in, in 1995, and, um, and continued pressure on Serbia and the EU uh, during this process of, um, of EU membership. So uh, yeah, I have, uh, I'm just going to escape out of my presentation for a second because I want to show you guys a couple of other things. Um, that I just have on my, on my uh, internet screen here. Uh, this is uh, uh, an activist, a German activist and artist by the name of Philip Rook. And um, he's actually working with the women of Srebrenica to set up a memorial of shoes. And uh, this is in Berlin where he did this in, in this year. But um, when I spoke with the women this summer, they were telling me that they're working with him to really, really make a larger memorial that would be located in Srebrenica. So this kind of shows a, a little bit of international solidarity work that the women are, are doing. 
Um, I also have, uh, uh, well, no, I don't have anything else. That was it. Um, yeah, so that, that um, monument is called um, Pillars of Shame. So I think with this, I'll, I'll just move on to case two, Dosta. And if you have any questions on, on that, the, the first case, we'll, we'll deal with it during the Q&A. Um, I don't want to eat up too much of, of Darko's time, but um, Dosta basically is a movement of, of mainly young people, but I think widely, you know, just encompassing all of um, uh, Bosnian society, even across ethnicities. Uh, and the movement was formed in 2006 by a small group of activists, including Darko, and now they're in um, 15 cities in Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, with each chapter having its own leadership. Uh, their primary focus is on promoting government accountability and responsibility, and a lot of this um, is attacking problems like passive citizenship. Uh, or citizenry, uh, government corruption and crime, and ethnic hatred, and how this uh, ethnic nationalism is really being used as fear tactics in the, in the political scene there. Um, oops, sorry, I should go to slideshow. Um, oops. Um, What's my slide show view? Slide show. Here we go, sorry. Okay, so again, uh, strategic thinking, um, I've outlined um, those plus nonviolent methods. Uh, again, categorizing omission, withdrawal support, non -co cooperation from commission, pressure and disruption. And um, this is just an outline of some of the things that Tosta is working on or has worked on, providing alternative social services. So really where the government isn't providing a service, the activists will provide it. And, and by doing that, they're raising awareness and also gaining uh, membership and recruitment and support uh, and making a name for themselves in the movement. Um, they have organized labor union strikes and supported um, such activities. Uh, in acts of commission, they've protested actively against rising electricity rates. And in fact, I think that that issue was one of the first ones that they took on and like basically what, what exposed them to, to, the, uh, to the society. Um, they do protest campaigns ahead of elections, and that's both municipal as well as presidential elections. And Darko will talk more about that later. Um, silent marches against corruption, petitions, and again, naming and shaming corrupt local officials. Um, they've used really interesting graffiti tactics to expose um, uh, prime minister corruption. They do internet campaigns, Facebook mobilization, road blockades, street art, theater concerts. So really, it's, uh, it's a kind of a, has a, a young, vibrant, um, tone to it um, that's, you know, helping people just join is, is uh, making it easier for them to join. These are some of the photos that, that Darko provided of some of the campaigns that they've done. And Darko, I don't know if you want to talk about just like a little bit about the Silent March and this creative protest. Yeah, basically, uh, hell, first of all, hello everybody. Uh, this is uh, actually from the from the beginnings of Dosta. Actually, both of these photos that you've got here, the the one on the on the left side uh, with, is, is a silent march that we did just before the last general elections, which were like four years ago, exactly from from today. Because we had just like three days ago, we had the, the next general elections, and they were like kind of kind of you know in a way saying that we are. The thing, the thing that we're all the time saying is like we won't be silent and we won't kind of like be, be, be taking it anymore. That's kind of like the, the, the whole idea of the, of the whole march. While the, 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 the one on the, on the right is basically an, well, it's an, it's an art performance done by the, by the students of the art academy in, in uh, Sarajevo together with some international artists and they, Individually, without any persuasion by us, chose our, our, our logo as, as, the, as the theme for this like big 
big sculpture that they made out of balloons. And it's, it was there like for, I don't know, like for, for at least two months it was standing on the, on the Art Academy, which is kind of like one of the most visible things in the, in the, in the city. That's just just a portion, just a portion of, of of the of the things we do out in the public. While there's a lot more after that, that, that was kind of like just the beginnings. In something uh -huh. in 2006, both of these photos. Okay, thanks. Um, and here I've just outlined again, a, uh, you know, f from conversations with uh, with Darko and others, uh, some of their successes are really increase increasing youth um, participation. Uh, and action, um, putting pressure on the government to fight corruption and to expose corruption, um, attention to local and national issues through the media, both citizen media and kind of using technology as well as as the mainstream media. Um, I'm going to have I, I start to talk a little bit about this resignation of the prime minister uh, last year because I, I really feel like this is. This is an activity and a campaign that really you, you can look at this and say, wow, just a couple of young people strategized around this and really with a, with a very unexpected outcome um, and, and basically using graffiti and Facebook. Um, and then, of course, the community services um, that, that they use as a recruitment strategy. So, Darko, maybe you could talk a little bit about the graffiti uh, around the pr prime minister, I find it very, very humorous. And, and uh, yeah, of course. Uh, we, we, well, we have to kind of like get into into that first with with saying what was what was before that there were like a, lo a lot of these actions that we did in 2006 after forming the movement that kind of raised the credibility and the visibility of the movement. Because I, I think personally that none of this could have been possible if we didn't have like. Enough, enough visibility, enough credibility by the by in the in the in the country, and then like what I want to say more is is after this this well big visibility thing that we had in 2006, we had to focus on something, and basically because we were all formed about about kind of like trying to to, to establish a proper governance in Bosnia, our first goal was was trying to establish accountability as something that was never. Existing before, at least not 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 in the in the aftermath of the of the war and the and the, and the government that we had by then, which we still don't have. I mean, we are still on the on the on the on the struggle of of really trying to establish accountability, which I will say more later. And then, like in 2008, we had first the first campaign on the local government level, where we kind of like managed to influence the 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 the, the results of the local elections 2008, where the party of the prime minister which we rallied against for a couple of months totally lost the, the election. So we kind of like from that point of view we had the credibility to do the action on, on the graffiti which was kind of like we, we tried to focus because our idea was trying to focus on individuals rather than the whole parties because it's easier to target their accountability because they are personally responsible and, and in the way that the, that the structures in Bosnia are formed you can barely find who has jurisdiction over what, but when you focus on a single individual, it's easier to find accountability and, and, and try to kind of like overturn turn the individual. In this case, we were, we were targeting the Prime Minister of, of Federation of, of, of one part of, 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 of half of Bosnia, for instance, and then like uh, we were trying to set the agenda on him like in, in various different ways and on various different issues. But one of these issues was most appealing to the public was basically he because he kind of like using corruption and using well not 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 most definitely legal things but at least borderline legal things bought bought an apartment in the center of the city very cheap for 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 almost no money and basically that was kind of something that was appealing to the public and then we had this like I would say fortune of of him backfiring of his activities backfiring on, you know on him. When we did well, not we, but but when when there was a graffiti action on his apartment building saying like you you give back the apartment you thief. After that, he with with no obvious reason to us at the time, he kind of like really reacted on on that, doing a big police action, interrogation, investigation. Even this even ended up being on parliament discussion. So he kind of like raised raised attention to the to the to the to that. And then what we what we did immediately after that in a day, we founded a Facebook Facebook group where people just left 
their names and faces and saying, like, I wrote the graffiti, please arrest me. Then they were calling the police, and also at the same time they were kind of like uh, sending emails to the police saying, okay, we are the ones doing it, please. And even as you can see on the, on the right side, there's this uh, T-shirt that people wore which says, I wrote the graffiti, of course. And then like after that, there was a big, big campaign against him by all, pretty much by all, all of the society. And then just a couple of months later, like two or three months later, he was forced by his party to resign and, and, and basically give, give his position to another person. So basically that kind of shows you that even without rallying on the street or gathering people offline, which which, people, which usually is considered to be the only way to do such, such thing, you can actually accomplish something. And that's yeah. what, to, keep, to keep it short. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I just think that this, like, it's so creative and brilliant because you know, here's this is a classic case of backfire, which ICNC has talked about through uh, another webinar, uh, as well as creative thinking and strategizing. You know, you have a, a, a prime minister who's trying really hard to uncover the price uh, of, of a home, and citizenry is aware that it's corruption, but no one is saying anything. And you know, you have uh, someone who graffitis on the home saying, "Hey, give it back." And then the government is trying to crack down. Who wrote that graffiti? And everyone comes out on Facebook and, and out on the street, I wrote the graffiti. So it's just like such a great and creative form of mocking um, that it, it really, like, the prime minister couldn't recover after that. And, and so, you know, through, you know, one could say through his own party pressure, but, of course, who put the pressure on the party is really the citizens. So it, it's just great. So, Darko, we we want to you know we want to allow for Q and A. So maybe you could just talk really quickly and run through. I know that you have ten slides, but we may not have time for all of them. But you know, I just want to let everyone out there know that this weekend on Sunday was uh, Bosnia's um, presidential. Like they have a tripartite presidency uh, as well as parliamentary elections, and really, you know. DOSTA has been instrumental in mobilizing uh, citizens uh, to vote in non-nationalistic ways to, to resist, you know, the fear tactics being used by different political parties. Um, and uh, Darko and I agree, and I've talked to different people in Bosnia, really the winners of this election on Sunday were the citizens. It was the civil society that won. So um, with that, uh, Darren, if you can switch the slide presentation to Darko, um, Darko can just uh, kind of run us through some of the activities that they undertook um, for such a success uh, this weekend. OK, so you see this? Yes, you are live, Darko. Okay, great. So basically, I'm just going to briefly go through the presentation since we have not much, not much time left and we want to hear your questions and comments. Basically, I'm going to talk about the elections and, and, and what our role in the elections this year was. First of all, I asked myself and then pretty much want to explain why working on elections. Because they are the basis of democracy, because it's easier to mobilize people for elections than for other events, the needed level of engagement is is not as big as in the other in, in, in the other things in, in order for the changes to come. Elections reflect accountability, which is probably the most important thing for us. And why not? We've done pretty much everything else as you already seen. <laughs> uh, just to go through quickly on on, on on through like what basic info on, on elections is pre previous basic thing is that previous mandate was pretty much one of the worst mandates that the government ever had in BNH and where we actually focused our, our attention and because of, because that was because the government coalition was pretty much formed by the parties that kind of ran against each other in the previous, in the previous uh, elections. And basically there's nothing much that on this. Uh, I'll give you just the goals of the stuff. Uh, first of all, we wanted to raise the turnout on the elections. We wanted to establish accountability as main principle for running the, the, the elections in, in the government. Uh, we wanted to change the pre-election discourse in order for the governmental parties to speak about what they did in the previous mandate. We wanted to create the momentum in the public discourse that the governmental parties actually have underperformed in the, in the previous mandate, not only 
to talk about it, but also to say that they actually underperform. Then we actually as, as did the thing that we all, always do is kind of try to mobilize everything around the issue that we that we really want. And this time it was the elections, and of course to create support to the movement goals in most communities in BNH, and create an image of a condensed and focused civic society with a lot of support of of the citizens, which basically Vanessa already focused on and said that. I think that, and, and I personally agree that basically the citizens and the civic organizations have gained most on these elections. What what did we do just to go briefly through it? First, we had an internet platform. There was a web portal that had all about the election. So we were kind of in the water, water education part of the work. Then we had something that was pretty much the, the biggest hit on, on, on of, our, of our activities was the this thing called Istinomir or Trutometer, as you would call it. That's kind of an accountability portal where we did the analysis of all the promises of governmental parties in the in the in, that they did in 2006 before the last elections. And then there was the Gostometer or Truth Meter, which is basically uh, giving you, as you can see here, somehow what, how how in accordance with the political parties you are. So basically, trying to give a, an, an additional voter education to the people. A lot of promotional activities, street actions, informational campaigns on different on different things regarding elections, exhibitions, media promotions. You see our launch press conference of the of the whole campaign. Then campaigns. We had the "You're Fired" campaign, which was kind of like a symbolic and pretty much the the, the, the highlight of the of the campaigns. Last chance. That that's kind of a viral campaign saying that the, the elections are the last chance for, 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 for us and we have like four YouTube videos and a, a couple of other things out there which are kind of very, very in presenting presenting our governmental parties or the leaders in, in, in some different positions and in some different, well, let's say, circumstances. So you, you might you might go to YouTube and check them out. So I'll, I'll, I'll basically end up giving you the, the, the links to it. Give us the prime ministers. This is also something to try to establish accountability with it because we wanted no no time before have the parties really reacted and said, okay, these are the prime ministers that we will that we have as candidates for the future. We try to for them to give give out the names, and only five of the 39 parties actually gave the names of prime ministers. And this is like the Geo TV campaign or the kind of like campaign for the voters to come to the elections, which we did with, with bands. And as you can see, there was lots of people on the events that we did. You see here on the on the left is the photo from Bihać, and on the right is, is the photo from the day before elections in Tuzla. And uh, I'm, I'm going to just quickly go through the results. As I see them, 250,000 new voters on these elections turn out percentage bigger than on the last elections. We had over 40,000 people visiting our web platform, over 30,000 people on our activities. We had over 1,000 media reports on us, even international media covered a lot of what we did. The governmental parties have lost over 1.5 million voters in these elections. Party that, in our opinion, has performed worst on our, based on our findings totally lost the election and is probably the, the, the biggest loser of the elections. The government will be different. In the, definitely different after these elections. Downside is the complicated election system that would lead to some of the governmental parties staying still in power. And also we hope that this will bring changes in the way this country is governed. And of course, in, in, in a manner of Dosta, we'll just change them again if they don't change it. That's it from me for this part. So basically, I'm, I'm done. Great. Thank you. So we'll turn it over to questions now. Or? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, Vanessa Dark, I want to thank you for a great presentation, and we'll open it up to, to questions. And I want you to know that we'll keep sharing your slides, Darko. And so if someone has a question and you want to refer to one of your slides, you can go back to it. And Vanessa, the same goes for you. If if someone has a question and they, you want to refer to your slides, I can make you the presenter again. Um, to all the folks who've logged in, I want to remind you that if you have a question, you can click the raise hand button on your webinar control panel and then I'll, I'll call on you and I'll unmute you and you can ask uh, your question directly to Darko and Vanessa or you can type in your question in the question dialog box. Um, so again, if you have a question, please go ahead and, and do that. 
Let's see, while people are, are waiting to uh, ask their questions, I had one question um, for, for, for Darko. There's a lot of uh, discussion um, here in the United States, but also around the world, about the role of the Internet in mobilizing people um, to do uh, actual actions. And I was wondering if, and there are people on both sides of that coin. Some people say that it, it definitely helps mobilize people, gets people to vote, gets people to take action. There are others who say that it actually doesn't produce those kinds of effects and that there's just a lot of hype around the Internet and, and social media platforms. So I'm wondering what your experience has been since you come from that background, you've used some of these tools. Do you see the Internet as, as being an, uh, an, an effective new way for people to, to mobilize one another? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the answer is definitely yes, and, uh, but, but, but I, I have to get back to the Bosnian reality, you know, like, and, and I think that Internet in Bosnia is probably the, the way to, to kind of, like, heal the country in the future, because that, I'm going to get back to the, to the mobilization later, but I think, like, that Internet is basically, for Bosnia, the thing where the people, where, where especially the young people from smaller communities that are kind of deprived of, of, of information, deprived of travel, deprived of meeting the others are kind of like, and, and, and are getting as, 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 you know, like radical as, as pretty much their, their, their older pe people in their communities or, or their parents. Uh, and, and I see the Internet as a chance there, you know, like I see, I see information that comes through Internet with, with, with raising the number of users in Bosnia as, as a real chance for the people to really kind of like grasp the, the, the ideas and the information that are out there and to kind of like step out of their dogmas that, are, that they are living in. So that's the first thing I see about Internet here and that's why we are kind of like really pushing it hard and even like we were with, with the things that we had, we were kind of like touring the country with a couple of computers setting them up, them up like in different places and trying to get the people also, not only the people who are online but to try to get the people who are offline to kind of like at least during the pre-election period connect to, to, to what we were doing online. And on, on the other hand, uh, our experiences are, are rather good, especially in the, in the bigger cities with, with mobilizing people, you know, like we've, we've been able to raise really big att attendance to our, to, our, to our protest rallies and stuff with, with, with Internet. And as you can, as you've already seen from, from, my, from the experience you had, is basically that, that we can, you can also do a lot even offline if you or even online if you have enough credibility and if it's kind of like going to, to, to appear on the on the mainstream media and if it's going to be the setting the agenda and that's what we are kind of like also using the internet for is trying to to set the agenda of the of the mainstream media and and, and that's what we did even through these elections we had like as I told you over a thousand reports of different mainstream media on, on, on our work which kind of like raised our visibility to, to I don't know, like we've never been this visible before as, as we were in the last month. So I think it's, it, it's kind of a, it, it, it's definitely a yes, but you know, like I think you, you need to work on it harder. You, it's not, you know, like just building up a site and saying, okay, things will work out or, or using a tool. It's, it's just about strategizing and really trying to see what's the, what's the population you're targeting, what's their demo demography, who are you targeting how and then you know like how to use internet in a proper way in your own community so basically there's a lot to a lot to think about not only just saying okay I'll use it and it will it will work like a miracle that's not the answer definitely great thanks Darko our next question from comes from Natalia Lozano uh, hello Natalia please go ahead uh, introduce yourself and go ahead with your question Yes, we can hear you. Hi, Darwin. Hi, Melissa. <laughs> Hi, Darko. Hi, Natalia. It's great Hi, Natalia. To hear your voices again. <laughs> so, for the rest of the people, I'm Natalia Lozano. I'm from Colombia, and I have like too many questions. The one is for Vanessa. I wanted to know if this idea of the models of Spencer being like this mad woman—it's a generalized idea in the society or is that just the idea of the authorities? And then to Darko, I wanted to ask you about this strategy of providing social services to the people. What kind of social services are you providing? How are you doing it? And where do you get the funds to operate? Because it's like a huge movement. 
So that I think that's it. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, well, I mean, I I can't speak for all of Bosnian society, and, and Darko can weigh in on this on this um, you know question as well. You know this this idea that the women are crazy or mad. I think it's a knee-jerk reaction in many societies when when um, traditional spheres of women is in the home, is in kind of nurturing uh, ideas or, or um, concepts. And when women come out, like in so, such large numbers, I remember I was living in Sarajevo in 1996, and the, the women of Srebrenica, they came in buses, thousands of them protesting in front of different international community offices, including the one that I worked in. And it was just such a shock to all of us, like, wow, where did these women come from? And, you know, I think that sometimes institutions, uh, maybe they don't want to recognize the power that civilians have because, you know, you're basically controlling things and, and, and you know, your your training and diplomatic methods and, and all of this is the way that things are so, supposed to unfold. So when all of a sudden you're faced with these women that are demanding something that is number nine on your priority list, it, your first knee-jerk reaction may be just to dismiss it as they're crazy, they're insane, they're angry, uh, they'll go away. But, um, you know, I think that their persistence um, and the articulate, the way that they articulated their demands, uh, really put them, um, uh, help to put their issues on the top of the agenda. I mean, in a matter of weeks, because from what I witnessed from different meetings, it was that all of a sudden, you know, Srebrenica, you know, um, mass graves had to be put uh, on the top because uh, a lot of. Um, uh, at, when you've um, when you have when you're in a, a country that has just gone through war, the last thing that people you know want to recognize is that there's another resistance, you know, whether it's nonviolent or not. And I think again, it goes to a lack of appreciation or understanding or misconceptions around nonviolent action. So um, I think that some of the reasons why these women are called this way, and again, it's it, Maybe it has a little bit to do with sexism. It has to do with traditional women's roles and where society believes they belong. And um, also has to do with, well, this is not coming from the top. It's coming from the bottom and a lack of understanding of that. So Darko, I don't know if you have a comment of that from your experience or if you just want to go to the next question, oh, to Natalia's other question. Yeah, I'll, I'll just briefly re re react on that. I mean, like, I agree, I agree totally with you on, 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 on everything. And there's this, you know, like, pretty much the, the prejudice in the, in the society even here that, you know, like, there's this aggression always that attached to the, to the, to the work of the, of the woman on Severn Inside. And, and I think, like, on, on the other hand, that's a good thing because I kind of, like, find the similarity with, with our work in that way. You know, like, on one side, you're very, you know, like, informed, you, you're kind of like raising issues and you're really trying to kind of like focus really hard on, on what you want. But on the other hand, there's always this, you know, part where, 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 where you, you're not anymore, anymore giving out hands and like accepting everybody. And, and, and basically, like, I, think, I think this, this principle works. And especially in the, in the, in the, in the later period of the, of the work of the, of the, of the women is, is basically when they really Kind of became more articulate in, in their demands and in, in their in their reaching out to first international community and then the local and and but the only thing that's that's exactly missing as as, as we find it is kind of really this this notion of accountability and 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 the thing that you know like you can really kind of mobilize people in order to give, to to give you support and I think that that's that's the future where 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 they should orient it more in, in mobilizing support and in really trying to trying to 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 kind of like get the people who, who make decisions turn more to them. But we'll, we'll, we'll see in the future. And regarding the social services that we provide, actually we don't provide social services. We kind of like uh, make examples of different social services that are, that are not provided. For instance, we are, we're, we're sometimes, sometimes organizing these like benefits for, for different 
for different groups that are that are in social needs. We're raising, you know, like money or, or things from the people. For instance, in the in the big supermarkets and stuff. And we we've been with these actions, we've been actually able to raise much more than 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 when the usual people who do who do these services raise. You know, like because we kind of have this attitude of of, of you know integrity and dignity that you know like that everything that we collect will end up in the in the in the hands of the social media and that's what, somehow we kind of like try to with our local groups and pretty much every local group that's kind of an, a local thing that's not a thing we do kind of generally all over the, the country but local groups organize around these issues in order to raise their credibility in the local communities they've organized i don't know like blood donations actions different there were there like a lot of different activities that kind of raised the profile, not only being the rebellious ones, but also being the ones that are kind of helping helping people people around. And, and regarding funding, well, actually, Dosta, Dosta has no, I mean, since it's, it's an informal movement and an unregistered movement, it actually has no direct funding, you know, like there are different groups, organizations that are kind of like paying for some expenses that Dosta has. Or basically, we are kind of like like raising raising the the, the, the money ourselves and on, in, di in different ways, or just like basically. But we are just using it for for individual actions. So you, you know, it's kind of like it's kind of well, it, it raises credibility in the, in the in the people, and on the other hand, it's kind of like really giving the edge that that most uh, most other civic society organizations, especially here, don't have since they're the present of presence of of like international. Community and international funding is, is is very heavy, and and they kind of like tend to lose credibility through this. So we're kind of like trying to 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 let's say be on the edge of the, of this and try to kind of like stay as independent as possible, and, and at the same time to work on, on as many issues as possible. I, I hope I answered the question. I think like that's 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 pretty much all I got to say on this. Um, our next question, uh, someone typed in Brian from Brian Gregg. Um, he asks Darko. To what extent were you influenced by the Otpor campaign in Serbia, and did you cooperate with veterans of that campaign? Okay, uh, thank you for the question. That's pretty much a thing that that everybody asks. Actually, we, we haven't. I'm I'm and and I'm not too aware whether like the the name Dosta or maybe the symbol that we use is the, is the open hand opposed to the to the closed hand that 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 for use has something to do because the the it, the, the idea for the logo, for the logo came from a guy who who, who lived in, in Canada at the time and he just sent us the idea so I don't know if, if that might be a, a sort of an influence but on the other hand we were kind of like just a spontaneous local initiative as, from the start and then and that's what we try to stay all all the time afterwards of course we're kind of like using all the different Ideas and, and 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 experiences that we can, but you have to you have to consider that kind of that, that Bosnia is a kind of a really special society in a way that is functioning, or, or I would even say a, 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 that, that there are many different societies within within Bosnia, much more than 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 there, that was in Serbia. And on the other hand, Serbia had had like kind of a concrete and very and in Serbia there was a concrete goal, while here we kind of like tried to try to focus on many different issues and, and, and all of these issues are, are in the top of the priority. So it's a different story, but anyways, we, we try to use all the experiences while we, we have individual contacts with some of the, some of the veterans from, from, from different struggles and movements, not only Otpor, but we kind of like, we, we wouldn't say that we are influenced by any of it or that we are kind of like sticking to any strategy that, that somebody else used. We are kind of we are trying to to develop everything in accordance to to what we think is the best for the for the current moment and the and the society that we live in. Great, thanks, thanks, Darko. We've got time for two more questions, and our next one comes from uh, Rosa Moywend. Uh, Rosa, it's good to to have you on board. Please introduce yourself to the group and go ahead with your question. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. you loud and clear. Okay. Hi, Vanessa. Hi, Darko. Hi, Darin and all participants. It's nice to meet in, in this uh, webinar. Uh, I'm Rosa from West Papua. Um, I have a question for Darko. Uh, but before I start my question, I want to say, it, oh, that's great job. <laughs> it's amazing to find, I mean, thousand people with the same idea to bring 
that issue, and it, it's really great. Um, it's interesting that you say that um, you're mobilizing people through internet using media, and um, I want to know if there are some uh, reaction from the opponent or from the government uh, uh, parties uh, related to your action because uh, I think they must doing something. So I want to know what what kind of reaction and how you and your organization or your movement deal with. Uh, that kind of reaction. Uh, maybe you you already explained in the earlier because I'm sorry I I was late. So yeah, I, that's just my question for you, Daiko. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, Rosa, for the question, and and, and it's great to hear your voice again. Uh, basically, to to be honest, you know, like we we we're, we're not in that in that state where 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 there would be like. A lot of repression on us. Maybe, maybe some some sort of a silent, maybe under the table repression of different kind. But you know, like regarding that, there would be like real some some physical repression. I, I don't think it's going to happen for many reasons. One of them is is us being established well enough and having support within within the society that that I don't think at the moment anybody could do that. But you know, regarding their reactions, there there were quite a few reactions because like. Especially now in the in the in the pre-election period, when we did most of our actions, there was a lot of a lot of reactions by the by the governmental parties that kind of like tried to say that all well, that we 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 found all our results of our of our, of our researches and everything were not correct and that we did a bad job. But basically, they had they they didn't have enough arguments for that. So I think that that fight was lost. And and, and even if you know like in in some ways they kind of influenced a couple of the media. Still, they 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 had to focus on where we wanted the pre-election discourse to go was basically to go towards the accountability and saying like uh, to talking about what they did in the previous four years, and I think that was the crucial issue, especially behind these elections that we ran in the, in the last two months, is was basically that we kind of really, really, really framed the pre-election discourse, and that that the, for all the experiences that I that I've shared. The main important thing is trying to kind of like get the get the the, the discourse on your table. Try to kind of like f that, that you will be the one running the show, and basically no matter what the show is, is it is on your on your court side. And that's the mo most important thing. That's the, that's the thing that happened with the local government here in the local elections. That's the thing that happened with the prime minister, and that's the thing that that happened now with with the elections in Bosnia. You know, like you have to really make them talk about what you want them to talk about, no matter what they say. And that, that, then you, you will succeed, definitely. Okay, excellent. Um, thank you for your question, Rosa. Um, and actually, I think we're going to get uh, Banu uh, connected now. So please uh, introduce yourself, Banu, and uh, go ahead with your question. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Sorry about earlier. I forgot to uh, click back to telephone. Uh, my name is Banu Demirat, and um, thank you so much for organizing this fantastic webinar, and uh, it was very, very helpful. Um, my question is actually about um, uh, movements and uh, organizations like DOSTA's um, involvement, not involvement, but uh, interaction with government and also media. So my question is both uh, to both of the speakers. Um, I I am also from the region. I uh, I'm from Turkey, uh, so the, obviously the experiences are very different. But um, uh, my question is more with, if any, the difficulties and challenges that Dosta and and other movements like uh, the ones that Vanessa shared um, that they have with the government um, and how they overcome. And mostly, my question is the uh, I mean. If the speakers can elaborate on, and the second part, uh, how they would overcome the challenges that they might the, these movements have with the government, the challenges. Darko, maybe you could start. Okay, I'll, I'll start. Well, basically, it's a it's a very simple thing. Even even if it's it's not as it's not easy to accomplish, but it, in my opinion, it's a very easy thing. You know, like. The only thing that, that, that political parties or the governmental parties or the people in government want is basically to, to have the power that they that they have got or to retake it or to take it over or, or to 
stay on positions that they are, you know, like so depending on where, where they stand at the moment. And what they what they usually value is either the votes on the elections or kind of like the, the public opinion and, the, and, the, and and what what the public thinks about them. So if you can like kind of focus your activities or, 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 or all your demands in, in a way that it will react reflect on either on elections or on the public opinion or whatever, that, that's the right strategy. And I'm, I'm not giving you the, the magic wand here. I'm just like trying to say what's, what our experience is and, and it's, it's usually the most difficult thing to do is kind of get this get the support get and media media plays a very important role in that and, and, and there you're right and we kind of had the luck from the start that, that all the media were were on us because we were kind of the first civic movement of, of that kind in Bosnia and then and we were basically like the, the only ones that were doing things in a way that we did it so probably it was it was like that was the reason why why we were so big in the in the in the media, and we, we had the visibility, and and we with our activities and with, with focusing on the right issues, we managed to maintain the the, the, the visibility and maintain the, the the media on our side. Not all the media, because like of course you can get that that, that that afterwards when we became a little bit more successful with our actions, there were a couple of media and then even more than a couple that kind of like tried to either 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 not talk about us or kind of kind of discredit us, but you know, like even if you're getting discredited, you still that means that you you are you're the opinion maker. So I don't know, like it, it, it's a it's a hard job, but you have to really focus on what the people on power want, and they only want you know like to stay there, and that's it. You know, like if you if you become a threat, then then they will listen to you more, and and then you can build up some sort of cooperation with them. That that's like. That's the point to build up cooperation. Is the point where you really have the influence over over what they want, and that's it. Mm -hmm. um, Darren, if you could switch to my screen again. Sure, sure. Um, I have a slide. Um, for I just want to show again my this one slide um, for Banu. Um, you know, I, I Banu, I could. Um, I could get back to you if we exchange emails um, and and offer you like more um, first-hand information about this issue of cooperating with government and the women of Srebrenica. But all I could do right now is offer you my observation from my personal conversations with them as well as conversations with others who work with them. I think that you know one of the challenges that they have, and I think that the challenge that all um, movements that are undertaking civil resistance have is this kind of um, um, the purpose of resistance and of nonviolent acts is to change behavior or change cooperation patterns of people or you know I mean there are many many other levels um, so if you look at these primary demands you can say well in some ways these women can cooperate with government or with international community. I mean, Bosnia is a, is a very unique case because the government actually, under the Dayton Agreement, the international community has a bit of jurisdiction over government decisions. So even saying government is Bosnia is like kind of questionable um, because it's Office of the High Representative and, and OSCE and you have lots of other players there uh, in this issue of exhumation of mass graves you have the you know international commission for missing persons and um, there I think that to say that they're cooperating with government it's more that they're working to pressure um, for change and policies and exposure but the cooperation probably more comes with some groups, international groups and NGOs. Um, but the great thing about strategizing and about listing achievable and articulated primary demands is that it becomes difficult for the government to challenge you on them. I mean, look at these demands. What Bosnian government wouldn't want to cooperate, you know, with them on this. So, you know, there's this kind of like, I think that some of the more um, forceful members of 
the women, especially in Srebrenica itself, would say, our goal and our objective is not to cooperate. Our objective is to pressure and to educate the Bosnian public and to make these demands. Um, but then there are other goals of, you know, um, that are more cooperative, especially when it comes to this issue of working with International Commission on Missing Persons for procedures and respectful ways of burying the dead, of respectful ways of creating a memorial there. Um, so, I, I mean, I would say it's both. On the one hand, yes, they cooperate at a certain level, and on the other hand, they probably don't, and they probably shouldn't. So, but this is always the challenge that I think um, people in resistance have. I mean, you want to extend the hand, but then in other ways, extending the hand is like is is falling back into the behavior patterns that governments want you to fall into. So, um, I can write to you more if I get your question and I actually pose it to the women themselves. I could get you firsthand uh, responses. Great, thanks, Vanessa. Um, we are a little over time, but we've got one more question um, to our good friend uh, Abraham. Um, so I'll read it uh, on his behalf. And Abraham's question is, do, does the government ever organize individuals or organizations as, civil, as a civil society group and use that group to support the government policy? Um, have either of you seen examples of this in, in Bosnia? I can talk about that a lot, but I'll just give you a, a couple of examples. There, 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 there are many groups that have been like used or misused, and even in some cases, like some, some, some organizations that are even these organizations that that, that kind of like are connected to the women of Serbians that have been, I would say, misused for 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 some political reasons. In some cases, also. There, there, there are like many, many groups. For instance, like it's the ex-combatant group that are often and usually being being used by the government as, as their advocates in, in in some issues. And even like you, you know, you, after we started, for instance, like there was one peculiar thing about Bosnia. Like after we started started doing protests, and then you know, like protests became a big thing about 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 the the the, the civic engagement in Bosnia, and where, where more and more people were turning to, to protest and really trying to, to establish this kind of like, uh, I would even say culture of protest in, in Bosnia, then you would have like different groups that, that we already knew that were in a way attached to the government, all, 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 I don't know, like all of a sudden organizing different protests all over the country and even like trying to kind of like see when we are about to do something then they would do it just the day before us in order for, for, for you know like for, for our, our, our activities to fail. So we have to turn to uh, alternative events or alternative activities in some cases, you know, like trying to, the, the, the main, main thing about this is trying to re-strategize, you know, like you're trying to, to, to really react upon this and try, try to kind of like make them be in the wrong place at the wrong time, you know, like, and then this, this is all, all the time, you know, like as we are changing the strategy at the same time the people in the government are changing the strategy, so, you know, like it, it's, it's, it's a never-ending game, you know. Like, and then you really have to have to focus on it. And of course, they're using the, the the groups and trying to even establish new groups to to use for that. Not only as advocates, but even you know, like as opponent, in order to kind of like minimize the effect of what what we are doing. So there are, there are different strategies there. Yeah, and I'll just add that I think that one of the ways that governments do this and like co-opt civil society groups is really through funding. I mean, at the moment where, you know, a group is receiving 100% of a, its funding from a particular government, you know, you're falling prey to the government agenda and the government interests. And um, I, I mean, I, I really admire the fact that those studies and accept government funding, I mean, this is a way of maintaining independence and not, uh, and, and, and um, preventing accusations. So I would say, you know, I think that groups can accomplish their independence and not be used or manipulated by being really careful about who they accept funds from. And of course, I know that there are governments around the world and, you know, that are trying to co-opt uh, civil society through money um, and programs and 
it's just something that civil society organizations have to be aware of and be really careful of. As hard as it is to sometimes say no to money, at the end of the day, it may not be worth, you know, that you know you lose credibility and, and legitimacy. So, or you risk that. Great. Well, I want to thank uh, you both, Vanessa and Darko, for a great webinar and a great Q&A portion. I want to thank all the participants who logged in today from around the world um, and shared your insights and questions. Um, I want to remind everybody that this webinar has been recorded and we will make it available on our website.